To the average American from the north, Brazil has seemed a remote and strange land of jungles, rivers, and mountains, with but one great center of civilization, Rio de Janeiro. Many had heard of Rio's fabled beauty. Some knew the name of its Copacabana Beach and even dreamed of a winter vacation there. But even those Americans who have been to Brazil have seldom seen much more of it than Rio. With its broad, handsome streets, its mixture of modern and traditional architecture and its friendly people, most of whom are far more conscious of the U.S. than the U.S. citizen is of Brazil. The one picturesque fact about Brazil the pre-war North American might well have been aware of was that Rio, during its annual carnival, is one of the gayest spots in the world. Though the U.S. Embassy at Rio has always been an important diplomatic post, the fortunes of war have made Ambassador Jefferson Caffrey a key man in the American diplomatic corps. For in 1940, the collapse of France placed Brazil in a position of crucial strategic importance. Only 1,600 miles at its bulge from Vichy French West Africa, Brazil could either become the landing point of a Nazi invasion, or it could become a vast air base from which the United Nations, avoiding the blocked Mediterranean, might carry the fight to Hitler in the Near East. What part Brazil was to play in the war depended upon the decision of its president, Getulio Vargas, a man distrusted by many liberal Americans. They knew Vargas to be a dictator, ruling 41 million people by arbitrary decree. In Brazil's propaganda bureau, busy glorifying Vargas and his works, they suspected a similarity to the propaganda methods of fascist Spain and Nazi Germany. They knew that Vargas was beholden for the existence of his regime to the army and navy officers who had supported his bloodless national revolution, and that many of Brazil's military caste were at least as sympathetic to fascism as to democracy. From Brazil, too, had come alarming reports of potentially dangerous foreign groups, ready to rise at the first opportunity. In Minas Gerais, Amazonas, and Sao Paulo were more than 200,000 Japanese, whose communities were reported to be hotbeds of undercover pro-Axis activity. In Rio Grande do Sul and Santa Catarina were a million Germans in scores of settlements as German in architecture, language, and customs as the Third Reich itself. Each settlement was reported to have its active Nazi cell carrying on in the provinces the work Hitler's agents were secretly furthering in Rio de Janeiro. But U.S. diplomats working with Brazil's foreign office reported that in Foreign Minister Oswaldo Aranha, the United States and its democratic allies had a great and good friend. To these experts, President Vargas' regime was no fascist state, but a benevolent personal dictatorship, which had won wide popular acclaim. If not democratic, it was to a large degree progressive and even liberal. To increase education and better the lot of the common people has been from the first an aim of the Vargas regime. Doubling Brazil's educational budget, it has built close to 10,000 new schools as part of its campaign to wipe out illiteracy. It has made free medical care available to school children of all ages in a determined effort to set new standards of national health. Vargas government has also attacked the health problem by constructing sewage systems in regions where modern sanitation had been almost unheard of. To combat malaria, it is ridding its swamps of the Anopheles mosquito. 
In this and other public health projects, U.S. medical men had been called in to teach techniques which Brazilian doctors will employ on a national scale. By its program of government housing, by its social and labor legislation, the Vargas government is today making good its promise to improve conditions among Brazil's people. Brazil's economic prosperity has always depended on coffee, of which it has produced 65% of the world's supply. This great export crop was the backbone of the Brazilian national income. But in 1940, Brazilians found that the collapse of the European coffee markets had almost wrecked an industry which had been in distress since 1930. U.S. diplomats realized with alarm that if Brazil's economy were allowed to break down, the friendly government of Getulio Vargas might not long survive. To meet the crisis, the U.S. government underwrote the entire unshipped balance of Brazil's coffee crop for 1941, 42, and 43. Meantime, U.S. credits were helping to build railroads to open up for development the untouched riches of Brazil's interior. As part of a project to industrialize the nation and give it a more stable and varied economy. For Brazil, today still largely agricultural, is one of the world's potentially great industrial nations, especially because of its immense mineral wealth. For great new steel mills now building in Brazil, the U.S. has advanced credits of $45 million. Steel from Mon Lavade and Volta Redonda will build railroads, first to open up more mines and then to serve new industrial centers. Before the war, the United States had already become aware that in Brazil was almost half the population of South America, a market still untapped when the war clamped down on American production for civilian export trade. And U.S. businessmen looking ahead to the post-war world already foresee that if Brazil's process of industrialization continues, its buying power may reach a colossal figure. In the pre-war decade, industrialization had already brought great changes to Brazil. By an audacious electrification project near Sao Paulo, rivers were diverted and sent plunging over steep natural escarpments where they have been harnessed to create an immense power supply. Out of this development came the astonishing growth of Sao Paulo, Brazil's second city and its greatest industrial center. Between 1920 and 1940, Sao Paulo's population jumped from 600,000 to a million and a half, making it the fastest growing city in the world. But Sao Paulo is no lone phenomenon. In the same two decades, Many another big city has sprung up in Brazil, such as Belo Horizonte, spacious and modern, planned in its entirety before the first building went up. When, soon after Pearl Harbor, Sumner Wells arrived in Rio for a Pan-American conference, much was at stake. Failure of the principal South American nations to follow the U.S. might endanger the whole American plan of defense. In this crisis, Brazil was the first South American nation to declare war on Germany and Italy. Even earlier, at Natal and other points on the Brazilian bulge, the U.S. got the right to build and operate its own military air bases on Brazilian soil. Within a few months, these bases were in full operation, the center of a system of military air transport lines greater than anything the pre-war world had ever seen. In hundreds of regularly scheduled flights a day, immense quantities of war supplies were speeding to armies fighting on three continents. Today, the world knows that without these bases and the planes and men flown from them, Rommel could never have been defeated in Tunisia. The Italian invasion probably could never have been launched. Even 
before America's Brazilian bases were in operation, Juan Alberto Lins de Barros, Brazil's able economic coordinator, had begun full cooperation with the United States in making available Brazil's strategic materials. One of the most vital of these is rubber. Though U.S. efforts to increase production of natural rubber were costly and only partially successful, the continuing yield has been great enough to constitute a valuable asset. Of great importance to altitude flyers is Brazil's Oitacica oil, which will not freeze however low the temperature. And without Brazil's vast resources and strategic minerals, the United Nations might conceivably have lost the war. Brazil is the only source of high-grade quartz, indispensable for modern radio equipment. Caught by the war with no quartz reserves, the U.S. was wholly dependent on Brazil to build its stockpiles up to par with those of the Axis. To this urgent need, Brazilian industry was wholly equal. Brazil is the only source, save far off India, of mica of a quality suitable for electrical equipment. And without Brazilian tantalite, there could have been no new electronic devices like the secret radar, which helped turn the tide of aerial and naval warfare. Today, Brazil, with its strategic resources, and the United States, with its vast military and air power, have arrived at a smooth working partnership unique in their history. To it, each has contributed. From it, each has gained. And there are many Americans who are resolved that it shall not end with the war but continue with mutual benefit into the years of peace. From the beginning, though its armed forces are not large, Brazil has been in the war to the limit of its capacities. In military aviation, it has made big strides. Close to 4,000 Brazilian airmen, trained at home or in the United States, are already flying some in the Mediterranean theater, some on Atlantic patrol. In their first year of war, Brazil's flyers hung up the proud record of 13 Nazi submarines sent to the bottom by their coastal patrol planes. Brazil's Navy, which at the war's beginning consisted of two old battleships and a few cruisers, destroyers, and submarines, has been increased by a new fleet of destroyers some of them built in Brazilian shipyards from U.S. blueprints. On trial runs, U.S. naval officers instruct the Brazilians in the handling of these ships. Small as it is, Brazil's Navy has been of important service to the United Nations in patrol and convoy work. In the days when Nazi U-boats were sweeping the seas almost at will, Brazil's destroyers were invaluable in helping to keep open the shipping lanes off South America's coast. Land-lease equipment from the United States has made Brazil's army into a formidable military force, by far the most modern in South America. And today, Brazil, backed by a powerful ally, need no longer fear the aggression of any of its South American neighbors. To consecrate its partnership in the United Nations, Brazil is preparing an expeditionary force, symbolic of its willingness to fight overseas. But it is on the South American front that Brazil has won a new destiny. And by its loyalty to its Pan American pledge, a new and potent voice in the Latin American world. Time marches on.